We're going to talk about a fascinating topic, the end of days, Acharit HaYamim. Explore if we are in fact in the end of days, how might we know if we are or not? What do, can we expect to happen? What's going to happen next? And what can we do about it? Very relevant topic to discuss right now with what's going on in the world. Are we really in the end of days? Maybe we are. The first time this term appears, end of days, Acharit Yamin, is in the Torah in the end of Genesis, where Yaakov Avinu blesses his children on his deathbed. And he tells them, gather, and I will tell you, I will tell you what's going to happen to you at the end of days. And then if you continue reading that the passage, it actually doesn't seem to be talking about the end of days at all. It seems to be talking about each of his sons, and there doesn't seem to be any open, explicit information about the future. But really, it's all in there. It's just encoded in the words of, that, of those blessings in, in secret. We're going to try to uncover some of those. And the term Acharit HaYamim appears several times in, later in, in the Tanakh. And of course, the Tanakh has a lot to say about the end of days, and so does the Talmud. And one of the passages in Masechet Sota is a famous one that our sages tell us, these are the things to expect at the end of days. These are some of the signs of the end of days in the footsteps of Mashiach, Be'ikvot Mashiach, what's going to happen? How will we recognize the, the world at the end of days? So the first sign is chutzpah yasgeth, that there's going to be a lot of chutzpah in the world, a lot of brazen behavior, immoral perhaps behavior, brazen behavior, a lot of pride. That's the first sign. The second sign, the yoker yamir, that there's going to be, everything's going to get expensive. A gefen titan piriya, that there's going to be, really there's going to be an abundance of everything, and yet things will still be very expensive. It's going to be hyperinflation. Money won't be worth that much anymore. That the government will turn to heresy. Minut, there's several ways to translate and define minut. The simplest is that it's heresy, corruption. There's going to be widespread corrupt government. Minut also means a mean, literally means a type. So it also refers to a very polarized type of government where everybody is in their own little circle and there is no unity. It's kind of like partisan government polarized, you know, Democrats versus Republicans, liberals versus conservatives, and nobody can get along. Everybody is in their own little group and there's, there's very little unity in the government. So it has that, carries that meaning as well. But mainly, the simple meaning here is that the government is just incredibly corrupt, the ain't to and that there's no, there's no re rebuke to the, this corrupt government. And Rashi comments here, en lecha adam like, like, no, nobody can do anything about it, really. Shekulam nichshalim bachatot, that everybody fails in their sins. And just a very sinful time, a very corrupt time in the world. And the sages continue to say, bet, bet vadi aznut that the gathering place of scholars, Beit Vad Shel Chachamim, is going to be a place of just immorality and, and debauchery. And when it comes to secular places of scholarship, that's very well known. If you look at what's going on in the universities today, the kind of atmosphere that's set up and the kinds of things that are taught uh, definitely would be in the category of znut, of just immorality and sexual licentiousness and debauchery and things like that. And then, that the Galilee will dry up. That's easy to see. Just look at the statistics that the Galilee has been drying up very steadily. The sea level has been falling steadily for several decades already. So the Sea of Galilee will dry up. That a place called Gablan will be destroyed. And so we're not sure exactly what Gablan is. The Sonsino Talmud comments here that it's probably the same place as the Gaval mentioned in Psalm 83, which is a place in basically northeast of Israel. So the Psalms mentions it together with Ammon, which is on the east side, east bank of the Jordan River. So it's somewhere in the northeast of Israel. Possibly the Golan, it's possible that the, the term Golan might originate from the term Gablan that's used here. 
So that area is basically where Syria is today. Right? Damascus is very close to the Golan Heights, to the border. And perhaps this is referring to the destruction of Syria, which we have witnessed in the past decade or so. And that leads right up to the next point, which is that there's, that there's going to be people going from border to border, from place to place, trying to find a home and they can't settle down. So there's going to be lots of migrants and refugees flooding the world. 13 million Syrian refugees displaced by the war and all the other refugees all over the world. Now we have Afghanistan and refugees pouring out of there. And of course we have the Latin American migrants and refugees on the border crisis there. So there are border crises all over the world and refugee crises all over the world. The Chochmot Sofrim Tisra. And the next sign is that the ancient wisdom, the wisdom of the Rishonim, of the earliest Torah sages, will putrefy, it won't be the same anymore, there won't be a value for ancient Torah wisdom, which again we see in the world today, in the secular world, in the mainstream world, that there is that religion is bought as something old, old-fashioned, out of style, out of touch with reality. And that leads to the next sign, Yerei Cheti Masu, that people who fear sin, that religious people are going to be despised, Again, we see that in the world today. The, the mainstream media always likes to put stories of showing religion in negative light. The religious and the religion is despised. The truth will be elusive, hard to find. Uh, we see that in the world today, that despite living in a world of so much information and so much potential truth and yet at the same time there's so much misinformation and so much lies and so much fake news and so much nonsense being spread all over the internet and social media and it's very hard to really uncover the truth and in another place the sages ask what does it mean like what does that mean that the root there is which means like flocks of sheep that truth will be segregated into particular flocks and every flock will think that they have the truth and nobody else and we see that in the world as well today every group has its own truth and is not willing to listen to any other group everybody thinks they know they have the ultimate truth and they know what's right and they won't listen to anybody else and they only listen to their own uh their own narratives and that there's that confirmation bias of just reinforcing their own false beliefs so our sages already warned of this 2,000 years ago, that I met the that truth will be put into these flocks and everybody will have their own truth and nobody's willing to really look at the real truth out there. And then there's a whole bunch of things that talk about the moral breakdown of society. Narim pneiskenim yelbinu, that youth will, will embarrass the elderly and will not honor the elderly, that the elderly will have to rise before the youth. Ben Menavel Av, sons go against their fathers and daughters against their mothers and mother-in-laws and so on, mothers-in-law. And Kala Bechamota, Oyve Ishan Shebeto, that the person's own worst enemies are now the people in his own house. And a famous statement, that it's going to be a generation of dogs. And a ben enomit bayesh me'aviv, that the children are not embarrassed and not ashamed of what they're doing before their parents. And finally, ve'al ma'yesh lanu lishen, on what is there for us to rely? Alavinu shebashamayin, only on God in heaven, our Father in heaven, because it's such a hopeless situation. Another passage in the Talmud says, Ein bein David ba, ad shirbu mesorot, that that the Messiah won't come until there's going to be a lot of informers everywhere. People who are informing to the government, people who get you in trouble for every little thing. Basically, very similar to the cancel culture that we have today, where a person can get in trouble for something they said 20 years ago or something they tweeted in for a little sentence that they tweeted 10 years ago, they could lose their job, their career could end. So 
that uh, our sages for, foresaw a time where people will, that this will be the reality, that a person really won't be able to say anything without getting scrutinized and being informed on and uh, being crushed in that sense. Another opinion here is that that there will be very few true scholars left in the world. And another opinion is that Mashiach won't come. So there will not be any more coins left in a person's pocket. Uh, perhaps this was a prophecy of uh, predicting our current move into a cashless society. That's been talked about uh, at length in recent years, cashless society, everybody's paying with cards, with plastic, with their cell phones, cryptocurrency, especially now with the, with the pandemic and nobody wants cash and everybody's switching to digital currencies and digital payment options, so no more coins. So there won't be any more coins in people's pockets, no more cash. And another sign is that the redemption won't come until it gets to a point where that people will, will give up on any thought of redemption. They're going to lose all hope. And that's based on a verse in the Tanakh. On the same page, the Talmud tells us that there are, that there's a seven year cycle before Mashiach in the end of days. So this passage appears in, in several places with slight variations. We're going to look at this one from Sanhedrin. So it says, what's going to happen in the seven years before Mashiach comes? So Shana Rishona, in the first year, uh, the prophecy of Amos will be fulfilled, which says, that there, it'll rain in one place and not in another place, and so on, that there will basically be wild weather patterns, uh, flooding in one spot, droughts in another spot. So strange weather patterns, which uh, we've, we've all seen in, in recent years. And then in the second year, something interesting is going to start to happen. In the second year, it says, that the arrows of famine will be sent forth. The arrows of famine. So something is going to be starting in the second year. And then in the third year, that there's going to be a great famine. In the third year, that's going to kill all people all over will be dying. Even righteous people will be dying. And all kinds of great people. Everybody will, nobody will be spared from this famine. And it will cause, it will cause like a, a forgetting of the Torah, a loss of Torah. So that's in the third year. Now, here the Talmud says that it's going to be a famine, but there is another opinion that what's going to hit the world in this time is actually a plague, a devil. So in the Midrash, it says that uh, that it's going to be a, a great plague, not famine, but a plague. So perhaps that has something to do with what's going on in the world around us right now. And in another place in the Tosefta, it says, uh, comments on the Torah when, when God, after the flood, after the flood of, of Noah, God said that there won't be any more. He would not bring another loya od hamayim lamabul, that he won't bring another flood of water. And the sages asked, why does it specifically say mine? It didn't have to say that word is superfluous to say water, that there won't be another flood of water. He could have just said, the Torah could have just said there won't be another flood, but it says there won't be another flood of water. So Rabbi Yossi Omer, why does it say Maim specifically? Mabul shel Maim ein, aval mabul shel Dever leovdei kochavim lemot Mashiach yesh. So Rabbi Yossi is saying is the Torah specifically adds the superfluous word water to, sell, to tell you that there won't be a flood of water, but there will be a flood of plague that's going to engulf the whole world before Mashiach comes. So with what we're seeing in the world today, it could very well be related to this, because I don't think there's been a time in history where there has been a pandemic, to, a global pandemic to such proportions as we have today. It wasn't possible in times past, simply because the world wasn't as interconnected as it is now. Even like the last great plague, which was the Spanish flu, it was devastating, but it didn't hit every corner of the world. Um, this current pandemic is probably the first 
possibly the first in history that really that no country has been uh, left spared. And that's partly because over the past century, even less, the world has become so small and so interconnected and you know, every city is connected with airports and so on. You know, even a hundred years ago at the Spanish flu, most travel was still by, by the sea, international travel. There weren't really any major airports yet. So the world has changed so much that today we have a truly global flood. So just like the flood in the time of Noah engulfed the entire world and not an inch of the world was spared, you have this pandemic as well that the sages predict that there will be a pandemic that will be like the flood that will engulf the entire world and no place will be spared. So in the second year, the arrows are sent forth for this famine plague, whatever this catastrophe is. And in the third year, it's, it's gonna be really bad. And then in the fourth year, that there's going to be a partial recovery, that some people are going to start to, to be satiated, but some will not. And then in the fifth year, that it'll be, that'll be the full recovery, and people will be back to the ochlim, the shotim, the smechim, that people will be happy again, and things seem to be going back to normal. The Torah chozeret lelimudea, that the Torah will also return. You think about all the lockdowns we've had, and and schools being closed, and certainly a lot of learning was lost during this time recently. So perhaps that's related to this. Maybe not. Maybe this is maybe the sages are talking about something else that's yet to happen in the future. But it certainly seems like it could be possible that we are in it right now. And then finally, the shishit in the sixth year of this cycle, kolot, there will be sounds. Uh, or rumors or sounds of, of impending war. Something is going to be brewing. And then the Shvi'it in the seventh year, there will be the wars as the Anach scripture prophesies, Milchamot, and the Motzei Shvi'it at the end of the seven year cycle, Ben David Ba, that Mashiach will come at the end of this seven year cycle. So, what are the wars like? So, the war is really described by our prophets, by Yechaskel, by Zechariah. So Yechezkel chapter 38 is probably the most famous part, talking about Gogol Magog, a very famous, uh, very well-known term, that at the end of the days, there's going to be this leader who is referred to only as Gog, this code name Gog, who is from a land, who also a mysterious land called Magog, and Nasi Rosh Meshech a president of this land. These are all encoded words, so we have to uncover what they might be referring to. And so here, if you read that whole chapter, it'll tell you what's going to happen, that at the end of days, there's going to be this uh, almost international coalition come against Israel, against the Holy Land, and mentions all the different countries that are going to come together. And the Malbim uh, comments here, that as we know, like the Tanakh says, that in the end of days, there's going to be like an international effort to fight, to come to Israel, to fight against Jerusalem, uh, surrounding Jerusalem. And he says, on the one hand, the, the army will stem from Mitzrayim ve'ashur ve'elam, she'em ha'ishma'elim, will be, come from the side of Ishmael, which is the Muslim world, the Arab world, and Mitzrayim, Ashur, that's Egypt and Syria, which were historically kind of Israel's biggest enemies and in 48 and in 67 and in 73. On the other hand, on the other side, though the fighters are Meshech Vetuval and the princes of, of the West, of the Western world, of the European world, of the Northern Kingdoms. Uh, and there's going to be, I mean, they're all going to come together to fight over Israel, but they're all going to fall over each other and, and hurt each other in the, in the process. Uh, we don't know what this Magog is that Ezekiel is in code talking about. And uh, we do know, though, based on the context, that that they are Europeans, basically, or from the Western world, and they're from the uncircumcised world. So as Ezekiel describes, as we're going to read, that they will come against Israel when, after the Jewish people return to their holy land at the end of the day. So this is something that the, the Malbim before, of course, 
long time ago already talked about before the state of Israel was even reestablished. And who are some of the key allies here in this coalition against Israel? So the first one that's mentioned is Pavas, which is Persia, Iran. And there's Kush and Putz and all these other places. And then Gomer, Vechol Agapea, Beit Togarma, which are places really, Beit Togarma is Turkey, places in Turkey. So we know today in the Middle East, the main adversaries for the state of Israel are undoubtedly Iran and Turkey. And so we see that in Ezekiel. And then uh, Ezekiel tells us when this is going to happen, when to expect this. It says, Becharit Shanim. So and, uh, again, in that term, in the end of years, Tavo el Eretz Meshuvevet Mechelev. So it's going to come after the Holy Land will return from the sword, from after the people will return from the sword. Mekubetzet me'amim rabim, that the Jewish people will gather in Israel again, gathered from many, many nations, me'amim rabim. And Meshuvevet Mechelev, after a great destruction, will, will befall the Jewish people. They will return to their land from many nations. Alarei Israel, back to the, upon the mountains and hills of Israel. Asher ayu lechorat amid. So, this is something that we saw very clearly in the last century, that after the pogroms and after the Holocaust, the Jews were moving, returning to Israel en masse and reestablishing their ancestral land. And in the meantime, that land, the Holy Land, had been asher ayu that had been a desolation, that the, the land of Israel, there's basically a, something encoded, there's a prophecy in the Torah that says that no nation really will ever be able to build anything prosperous in the land of Israel, except the Jewish people. And we see that, that in, in the past, over the past 2000 years, if not more, that really no other nation, no other empire has really been able to make anything successful out of the Holy Land. Uh, only when the Jewish people are there, does the land prosper. And I'll just quote from Mark Twain, who visited there in the 1860s. And he describes what he saw when he traveled through the Holy Land. At that time, it was really popular for Westerners to travel to the Holy Land and see some of the holy sites. So Mark Twain was one of those people. Also, um, Ulysses Grant, the former president of the United States, traveled there. And many others, if you read their journals from their travels to Israel during this time in the late 1800s, they all describe it in the same way. So I'm just going to quote from Mark Twain. He's saying that when he went to Israel, he says, quote, a desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil had almost deserted the country. Of all the lands that there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. Can the curse of the deity beautif beautify a land? Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. So, I mean, it's, it's clear, and he has a lot more to say about this very poetically, how Palestine, Israel is completely desolate. There's nothing going on over there. Right? So all the people who claim today that before the Jews returned and rebuilt this country and made the deserts bloom, that apparently there was some <laughs> previously existing nation that flourished there. It's, it's an absolute lie and a joke. If you read every account of travelers that went to the Holy Land in the 19th century all describe it the same way, that it was desolate, there was nothing there. It was a deathly place, a cursed place. And it was, it was only when the Jews started to return there en masse in the late 19th century that it started to flourish and they rebuilt it as the Torah prophesies. So that's uh, the miracle of Israel. So finally, the Jewish people will return to their country and they will be able to build a strong and prosperous, prosperous state of their own. And that, that was prophesied by Ezekiel, Yechizkel, and we, we are lucky enough to have lived through this and to see this happening before our eyes. And some of the things that are to come that have not yet happened is what, what Ezekiel tells us what's going to happen when this war ultimately takes place, this war over Jerusalem and Israel which we're already seeing the beginnings of, that's been happening for a long time, that the whole world wants a piece of the Holy Land. There are so many players involved. Uh, the, whole, the United Nations spends so much of its time just discussing Israel constantly. Israel's under the magnifying glass. Um, that the, Israel has more resolutions passed against it in the UN than any other country, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So it's one country out of over 200. But the United Nations spent so much of its time scrutinizing Israel and everybody wants a piece of it. So we, we can already foresee how this is going to happen. 
how the whole world can come against Israel and often does at the United Nations. And another thing we can expect, Ezekiel says that there will be a rash gadol al admat Israel. There will be a great earthquake in Israel, and there's going to be all kinds of other things. Avenishpatati ito bedever uvedam. So again, that word dever, there's going to be a plague, dam, blood, geshem shotef avne al gabish esh ve gofrit. So um, hailstones with uh, fire and brimstone and so on. That's very reminiscent of the plagues of, in uh, Egypt during the Exodus. And that connection is not coincidental. It's supposed to be that way because the, the miracles at the end of days and the plagues that will come upon the world at the end of days will be very much like what happened in Egypt in ancient times at the Exodus. And the prophet Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, says the same. So he's saying that days will come, that a day will come when that people are no longer going to commemorate how God took the Jewish people out of Egypt but God, people are going to uh, praise God for being the one who took Israel, the Jewish people out of the countries of the north and all the countries of the world where he exiled the Jewish people and he will bring them back everybody and he will put his, the, the Jewish people back on the land that he gave them. So Jeremiah says that a time will come. Right now we commemorate the Exodus every year. and talking about how God took us out of Egypt. But a time will come when that will be superseded by uh, how God will take us, not from how God will save us from all the countries of the world and gather us from all over the world back to Israel. So it will be even greater than, in some ways, than the miracles of the Exodus in ancient Egypt. So that's some of the things that we can uh, expect to see in the near future, if we really are in the end of days. And so we'll end off by saying, what can we do about it? All this is supposed to happen. What can we do about it? So I think um, there's an interesting parallel passage in another work called Perik Shira. So Perik Shira is basically uh, this text that compiles verses from all over the Tanakh and, and some other places and tells us what everything in nature is singing. There's this idea that everything in nature, everything that God created in the universe is singing to God. Everything is singing. Or the whole universe is singing to God. And there is real, a real kind of scientific meaning here because even from a scientific perspective we know how important vibrations are everything is vibrating everything is energy everything is waves in the universe you can write a wave function for basically anything any piece of matter can be described as a wave as vi and, and vibration and and if you go into string theory specifically talking about how everything in existence comes into existence because of vi little vibrating strings so it's like as if everything is really the whole universe is like singing. It's all vibrations, energy waves, and it's like everything is singing to God. So Perik Shira records what all these things are singing to God, you know, what the skies are singing and what the plants and the trees and different animals and so on. And there's one animal that's really unique, uh, which is the rooster, which has actually not one line, but seven lines, seven different lines. And so that... I think very neatly parallels to the seven year cycle of the end of days. So in the first cycle, the Kol Rishon, or in the first call, I should say, in the Kol Rishon, in the first call of the rooster, what does he say? He says, Zadov Doshav, that this is the generation that needs to seek God, that seeks God, that needs to find the face of God. And that's our generation. That's the first call. And then the second call says something really similar, that now is really the time to seek out God in a world that's trying to bury God, bury the idea of God, that's very secular, that's pushing secularism and atheism. Now is the time to find God and return to God. And in the third call, the rooster says, uh, that rise, all the righteous people need to rise and, and focus on Torah and mitzvot and learning and doing good deeds and, and fulfilling God's word. Become tzaddikim. So that your reward in the afterlife or in the world to come or when the Messiah comes, that the reward will be multiplied. Now is the time to maximize your good deeds. So that corresponds to the third to the third year of that cycle, which 
is that most difficult year, right? When there was that Rav or Devil, this famine or plague that's gonna, that's gonna really devastate the world. That's the good time to focus on Torah and Mitzvot and, and growing closer to God, repentance and growing closer to God on spiritual development. And now really is a good time when we have all these lockdowns all over the world and there's so there's not much to do. A lot of places are closed and you can't really travel and there's not much to do. Now is the time where it's an opportunity to focus on spiritual matters instead. And in the fourth call of the rooster, it says, that the rooster calls out, quoting from that same blessing from Jacob with which we started, Jacob to his sons, this one was specifically to his son, Dan. And he said, that I, I await your salvation, but I hope for your salvation. So it's a call not to lose hope, that to continue praying for salvation, that it might seem like, again, it's in that fourth year where things are still really rough and it looks like all these troubles that are plaguing the world are not going to end. So not to lose hope. Stay strong and not to lose hope. And in call five and six, really important. It says, When are you going to wake up from your sleep? And in the sixth call, it's very similar. Open your eyes. Right? So it's a call for everybody to open their eyes, to wake up from this slumber, wake up from this cover that's been uh, put over our eyes and start to think independently and start to look and see what is really going on in the world. What is happening in the world? What is going on with this? Where is the world heading? It's time to wake up. Open your eyes. Right? Uh, come out of the box for a second and start to think for yourself. Don't just listen to what society is constantly uh, inundating you with on the radio and on TV and in the news and in the press conferences from the government, it's all this like the same story over and over and over again. And it's, this is uh, not exactly where the truth lies. So open your eyes and see where the truth lies because the truth always lies on the side of God and on the side of Torah. So this is the call to wake up and see what's really happening in the world. Step out of the box, stop sleeping. And finally, in the last call, the Kol Shvi Yomel, Et so again, he's quoting from Psalms, a verse that says, it's time to stand up and, and act on God's behalf because the world has desecrated the Torah and broken the Torah, it's turned the Torah upside down. So it's time to stand up, stand up for the truth, stand up for God. And it sounds like a cliche, cliche but it's not really a cliche. This is really now is the time because uh, there's all this misinformation in the world, all these lies are being spread. Now is the time to stand up for truth and share truth and, and wake people up to the truth uh, on, on many different levels. So stand up for truth. That's the last thing, fight for truth, stand up against tyranny and, and oppression and everything else that's happening and the lies. Stand up for goodness, stand up for the Torah, for God, for righteousness for morality, for logic, for everything that's good. And uh, I'm just putting this here because just to finish on a Kabbalistic note, we know that there's this idea of 10 spherot, that there are kind of 10 divine manifestations of, of God, the attributes of God, 10 energies that permeate the universe um, that God created and the universe is uh, kind of imbued with these particular energies. And the central one is called Tiferet, and Tiferet one is, is the one that is in the middle, that's the balancing force of all the others, and it's the central force, and it, it stands for truth. It's called, and oftentimes it's referred to as emet, as truth, and Tiferet is always is, is described as the spiritual root of the souls of Israel. That's where Israel emerges from. It's also the root of the Torah. That's where the Torah emerges from, from the place of the truth. And so now is the time to really stand up for truth. And our sages say that at the end of days, that it's specifically in, in the realm of Tiferet where we're going to have to fight and struggle. In Tiferet and in Yisod beneath it. In Tiferet and Yisod. Yisod meaning referring to everything that has to do with uh, sexuality. And Tiferet where it has to do with truth and, and godliness and balance. And these are the two main challenges at the end of days. 
this is where the world is going to be. That's, that's where the struggle is in, in Tiferet and in Yisod. And the Ramchal, for instance, talks about uh, there's two phases, two major phases in the end of days, and one corresponds to Tiferet and one corresponds to Yisod. And this is where all the rectifications lie in, in standing up for truth, standing up for morality, for righteousness, for purity. So in Tiferet and in Yisod, and the main one is in Tiferet specifically, to, in a world of lies, in an Alamad Shikra, in a world of lies, that we need to stand up for truth and, and share truth as much as possible. Uh, that's our main job right now. I hope this was enlightening.